Thank you very much, Steve, and it's actually quite a privilege to come and uh, uh, talk to people in this group. And I just mentioned to Steve, I've got to remember to stand still while I'm talking, which is not my usual yes, style. And do not move away from the microphone or we'll lose sound as well. So I'm going to speak to you today about the flight that several members of this club made in September of this year to commemorate the uh, 100 year anniversary of the first scheduled air service in Western Australia and indeed Australia. And that was the mail and passenger service from Geraldton to Derby, uh, commenced by Norman Brearley's Western Australian Airways Limited in 1921. And for the sake of the record, uh, people who want to debate, well, where did Qantas start first? Well, Qantas was actually formed as a company before Norman Brearley's Western Australian Airways, but Norman Brearley's, or Western Australian Airways, actually made the first scheduled, uh, introduced the first scheduled air service, which actually got properly underway at the beginning of 1922, as we'll get to, and Qantas then commenced their service in Queensland somewhat later in uh, 1922. Just before I get to talking about this original air service and a, and a bit of a potted history and why we're commemorating it, I'm going to plead that I'm only a relative newcomer to aviation compared to many people in this room and you may well detect uh, errors in my potted history. That's fine, it's the spirit of the story is what we're after here. Um, so I'm not going to compete with many of you in this audience that actually are aviation history. So I'm just a, a bit of a novice enthusiast. So, Earlier this year, uh, myself and others at the Royal Aero Club were actually approached by two of Norman Brearley's grandchildren, Simon and Sally Benison, uh, to commemorate this 100 year anniversary. And I have to say, it's almost a little bit embarrassing that the club wasn't actually on to this earlier of our own, of our own volition, um, given uh, Norman Brearley's long, long association. But nevertheless, we, we got on to it and we very quickly uh, got on to organising a few events of which the commemorative flight was one. So at risk of, of grossly simplifying and understating the story of this first scheduled air service, I'll give this very quick summary. And on that I'll draw from the, from the book, which I did actually have in my bookshelf before I actually started flying for a hobby. And I vaguely remembered about that book. It's quite a, quite a good little read if you want to Scour second-hand bookshops or the or the interweb for Australian Aviator by Sir Norman Brearley. The only disappointing thing is, is I gather that Norman Brearley was obviously a very modest chap, even though I've never met him. But I gather he must have been a very modest chap and a man of very few words, because there's this amazing story of this first scheduled air service, uh, but it's all done in 30 pages and glossed over and and you find yourself really wanting all the extra detail and all of the, the back stories and so on of this event. But um, maybe you could have done with a, a, a bit of help, as happens these days with ghost authors and so on, uh, that maybe would have dug a little bit more out. Anyway, back in 1919, the then major uh, Norman Brearley had returned to Australia from the theatre of, of World War I, uh, both as a combat pilot and as a then as a flying instructor. And he was actually came back determined to forge a career in commercial aviation. Um, not sure he had that much idea of how he was going to do that, but nevertheless that was his intent. And he brought back to Australia a couple of surplus Avro 504 biplanes and was eking out a living uh, barnstorming, uh, charging then three pounds and 15 shillings for a 10 to 15 minute flight. And I did a, did a quick calculation I, back before I uh, decided to dissipate my wealth in aviation. I used to earn a living being an economist, so I, I like this sort of numbers. Um, but I worked out at the time that was about the average weekly wage in Australia for, uh, for going up for 10 to 15 minutes. I did a comparison. You can now buy four and a half hours of Joy Flight in a Raquis Cessna 152 with an instructor for the average weekly wage. So uh, anybody who says that aviation is becoming too expensive and uh, prohibitively expensive should look at the statistics. I think we just find different things to spend our money on. Anyway, 
in mid, so he was up running around the country doing these, doing this barnstorming, and then in mid 1921, he had the, the great opportunity presented itself of the Commonwealth government going out with a tender uh, for someone to commence and operate an airmail service from the railhead at Geraldton. Uh, up the coast or around the coast to Derby, a distance of some uh, 1,200 nautical miles. Um, Why did they start from Geraldton? Because they didn't want an air service competing with trains, was the, was the answer. Yeah. In a leap of faith that he would actually find the wherewithal to actually provide the service, he saw fit to put in a tender before he had any capital, any company structure, any aeroplanes <coughs> even. Um, and uh, I think that is the, the sort of uh, start of the audacity of the guy. To, uh, to do this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And actually, that, that tender was, was ultimately ultimately successful. I'm not sure how competitive that actually was. There weren't a lot of people providing air services at that time. Anyway, so he had four months from the time he actually was awarded the, the tender to secure financial backers, to actually raise the finance to the tune of what the equivalent of about $5 million in today's money. Um, form Western Australian Airways as a public company, procure and actually have delivered uh, six Bristol tourists from the UK, recruit pilots and crew, and deal with the federal government for construction of airfields and make arrangements for fuel and various other logistical matters. And he did all that in actually four months. And that is incredible. There is no way, no way you could do something like that today in so short a, a period of time. Um, and I think, you know, it's maybe it's the sort of greater can-do attitude of both the man and the uh, and society of the time where you could actually just get up and, and do things like this in a remarkably short period of time. Um, so there he was with three Bristol tourers leaving Perth on the 4th of December 1921 en route to Geraldton to commence that service on the next day on the 5th. And uh, the record of history, of course, is that the first flight ended in um, disaster and tragedy uh, shortly after it commenced when one of the Bristols crashed at Murchison Station, uh, killing the pilot and, and an engineer. Um, and with that setback and with a need to have a better preparation of airfields and generally uh, maybe approach, it in a, approach the task in a more measured way, uh, the service did not actually then get properly commenced until February 1922. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that first flight was on the 5th of December 1921, um, and hence the, we, we take that as the, as the centenary. Um, so as I say, with the club was approached by Simon and Sally Benison, we got on, on board and uh, decided to commemorate the anniversary of this flight, and uh, we are a flying club. So uh, how do we commemorate things? Well, we go for a fly. Um, I quickly had to go and read up on some history. As I say, found the book in my bookshelf. Um, and, uh, uh, and we decided to organise this flight to cover, the same, to cover the same route. So we started to plan the flight in April. Uh, we straight away uh, had a very strong interest in participation. Uh, sort of 25 crews and aircraft um, started turning up to, to meetings and we ultimately ended up with 23 on the actual trip. Which by today's standards of recreational flying and club activity uh, was a remarkably good turnout. Um, uh, maybe we can uh, give some credit to the pandemic for that and people were itching to go and do something on, on holidays rather than skiing in Europe, maybe. But uh, nevertheless, we'll take it. Uh, we then sort of started rounding up a whole lot of interest from the from the local communities um, uh, along the way and worked out where we were going to stop. Got some stickers made for aircraft because that's what you do. Formed our route, which was basically fly up the coast, uh, get to Geraldton, start the flight at Geraldton, uh, up to Carnarvon, uh, up to Onslow, uh, through Caratha to Broome, and, uh, and then up to Derby. So we covered the, the flight in, in three days. We did get some very, very good support from, from Onslow, Broome and, and Derby. And, uh, oh, firstly the fleet. So we had quite a varied fleet, um, right from Kevin Bailey's um, Stinson, uh, right through to, to the, uh, quite a collection of Vans aircraft. 
shows yet again that uh, Vans Aircraft have just about single-handedly rescued recreational aviation in the world, I think. But a great turnout, great variety of great variety of aircraft. And there they all were actually parked there at, at Onslow. So what we did was, uh, as well as enjoying the flight, we saw this as actually a way to, to uh, develop knowledge of, the, of that first flight. And so we actually, with the local governments, organised some really good community events along the way. And uh, we had the crew there, uh, the ladies in pink, um, from uh, Wendy Mann's crew from, from Geraldton. Uh, we had uh, the two, two granddaughters of Norman Brearley, um, Sally and Kate Benison. And uh, yeah, great crew, lots of people all having a good time. Onslow came on board, and if anybody's been through Onslow Airport lately, unlikely, but you may have, um, above their baggage carousel, they did a, a great wall drop. Um, and that was the sort of support we were getting from the, from the Shires to actually spread the message about this bit of, of aviation history. Uh, we had uh, presentations um, of plaques at each of the airports we, we stopped at. So they're going to mount plaques on their, on their uh, terminal walls to mark the occasion. We had Mick being the, uh, being the postman. Well done, Mick. So we had letters from the uh, governor. That, um, Kim Beasley that we were dropping off on the way as well, all to have a bit of fun and say something to get the community involved in the in the event. Uh, that was one of the councillors there. What was his name again? Mick, do you remember? No. Anyway, he'd actually uh, come across from from Parabadoo, um, saw that the parking area wasn't ready for us, got on one of the contractors' machines, smoothed it all out for us, took over a whole lot of concrete blocks to use for tie downs. Whacked on his suit and was there to receive the letter and the plaque at the end of the day. So quite a bit of, of country hospitality and spirit there. Maybe he was one of the guys in the in the spirit of Norman Brearley that could have got this thing to happen in four months if he was if he was there at the time. Broom put on a uh, an open day. Um, we displayed some of the aircraft, obviously including the Stinson, which is a uh, quite a cloud crowd puller, um, but also um, oil and gas aircraft. Uh, flying doctor aircraft and uh, other bits and pieces of equipment, um, which again got the community in. We gave the talk about the about the history uh, and about the purpose of our flight, um, which uh, got surprisingly good good reception. People would really like to know this bit of of Western Australian history. Derby, we got the full on reception there. I said when uh, when Derby Shire said they were going to do hors d'oeuvres for us. I thought, how many people in Derby know what an hors d'oeuvre is? But nevertheless, they came up with the goods. And, uh, and we got a great reception at Derby. And I think we got most of the town there into the terminal for a talk about, about the history. Um, and we also uh, chose a local uh, charity there. We'd accumulated quite a sum of money in fines of pilots on the way, as you do on these events, for various, for various mistakes and misdemeanours, um, and donated that to a local charity, which was great, great profile for, for recreational aviation and the, and the club. Uh, and of course, there was a whole lot of great flying on the way. We were, were blessed with very good, very good weather uh, for the trip, and um, I think the worst problem we had on the entire flight was one radio. Uh, one, one aircraft we ended up with no radio for a little while there, but even that was fixed very quickly with getting another one flown up from from Perth um, and getting that installed. So everybody made it up there, everybody made it back with with no great problem, which is actually pretty good going for uh, for 23 aircraft. Um, talking with the with the pilots that, that participated um, certainly showed that there is quite a demand for this sort of flight and this sort of event. In the state still something I think that we as an aero club really need to get rejuvenated uh, because there still actually is that demand there's a lot of people who still find flying long distances across Australia uh, a little bit intimidating and like the comfort of a group to, to do it in and so we as a club are going to work on that concept and uh, we're already working on our planned flight probably for spring next year to shoot off across some fairly barren areas of Australia um, well, that was the, the flight. We did have a, uh, we got a little thing, 
bit of a potted history of the flight put together, um, again with the help of, of some of the local governments. District. But in, in closing, I mean, what, what impressed me, because as I say, as a newcomer to aviation and getting into this history, was just the sheer audacity of, of the guy. Not, not only the personal audacity of going out there and <coughs> flying across remote areas without even knowing whether your airport has been constructed <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, uh, you know, of course, maybe after being shot at in World War One, everything is, is maybe a little bit, you get a bit blasé about, about other things in life. But the sheer, the personal audacity, but also the commercial audacity to be able to raise that capital, to go into that an unprecedented business venture and to do it so successfully. And if you look at the records of his flying, he was in the high 90% of, of uh, flights completed on time. Um, it's right up there with, uh, with the KPIs of commercial airlines now that uh, you would wonder how they possibly meet, because many of you like me would have spent many hours sitting there on, on aprons waiting for aircraft to take off. But uh, very, very successful um, service this, this evolved into. into. So that was, that was our flight. Um, <laughs>